<laughs> incredible, incredible, incredible. First and foremost, uh, can we acknowledge the incredible effort and creativity of the whole Castora team? I mean, just, just an extraordinary day. I mean, the, the musical number alone was, was worth the price of admission, right? So, uh, really, really, truly, uh, an incredible set of talks, uh, uh, just, uh, just a great set of accomplishments and breadth of use cases. And on a very personal level, uh, everything that Corey just mentioned, it's incredible for me that a lot of these ideas that were just putting out there 10, 15 years ago, I'm just sitting here like a kid in a candy store. It's actually a lot healthier than being in a candy store. I'm just watching you all talk about customer centricity, customer lifetime value, uh, and, and doing it the right way, you know, avoiding kind of the demographic this and that. I, I, I loved what Ingrid from ELF was talking about this morning that, you know, let's not just put people in buckets by how they look, but let's just celebrate heterogeneity. And great stuff. Congratulations to all of you for actually uh, helping move the marketing world ahead in a way that it so desperately needs. And along those lines, while there's been such a great breadth of examples, they've all had something in common. They've all been about customers. It's, it's like, you know, we understand that customers are kind of important here, right? Um, and let's just take our understanding of customers and just kind of raise it up a level. I want to talk about a domain that doesn't have the word customer um, in its vocabulary at all. And I mean that kind of literally, the world of finance where all they look at is just this flow of dollars over time, and they don't really care about what's going on below the surface of it. And my contention is that instead of just looking at the flow of revenue, if we could break it down into customer behavior, if we could take them back to those marketing classes that they did their best to either skip or sleep through because they felt it was below them, we have something to tell them that if we can project how many customers we're going to acquire and how long are they going to maintain relationships with us and how many transactions they're going to make over that horizon and the value of those transactions, that we can do a better job of forecasting revenue and therefore estimating overall corporate valuation. And by the way, we can also give them a good understanding of why revenue as high as it is, or why it's plateaued, or God forbid, gone down, you know, which of those different behavioral components is most to credit or blame? So we really do have something to tell them. And I've been putting diagrams like this out there for a long, long time, even back when, when Corey was taking my class, where's Jordan? And Jordan Elkind as well. When I wrote my first book on customer centricity, um, he was my ghost writer. So all the blog posts on the book, Jordan. Um, so you could blame him. Um, so uh, I was putting these kinds of diagrams out there for a long time, but it was more kind of aspirational, like, hey, finance people, we have something to say as well, that we can help you figure out the value of all those operating assets by looking from literally from the bottom up at customers doing things over time. And for me, it was just that. It was just an idea that I couldn't necessarily follow through on. Fast forward, some of you know, I started up a company called Zodiac, where we're doing a lot of lifetime value stuff, not much unlike Astora. Sold that company to Nike last year. Uh, and now we're really drilling down with this, this new firm that I have, Theta Equity Partners, specifically, exclusively looking at the finance applications, customer-based corporate valuation. So I want to share with you just one case study today. Again, there's just the idea that, you know, let's predict how many customers are going to acquire, how long they're going to stay, what are they going to do over that time. Do all the accounting stuff as well that kind of either scares or bores a lot of us, but it's kind of important to do that stuff well. Um, so uh, we're having such a great time looking both at private companies, working with private equity firms at that digitally native men's underwear company and tell them what that company is worth through this bottom-up lens, or public companies, in particular IPOs. And it's been glorious that so many companies have been putting out a pretty good set of metrics, not all, uh, in their IPO. So here's Farfetch, a company that many of you might know. These are directly taken from their IPO last August. Now, not every company puts these kinds of metrics out there. In some cases, the metrics that companies are putting out there are just junk. Like Peloton was telling a whole bunch of lies about its customer retention and lifetime value in their S1 filing. We try to debunk all of that and say, here is the truth. But in some cases, they're just putting the numbers out there and just leaving it at that 
almost a signal to the market, hey, we have data. Okay? <laughs> That's going to raise our stock price. But when they put the right kinds of metrics out there, like these over here, and it's not at all obvious that these would be good metrics and that other ones might not be, but and happy to talk about all that. It is my job to reverse engineer all of this stuff over here, and I'll, and I'll talk about it in more detail, um, and then basically piece it together, and not only fit the curves over here, but understand the underlying behavioral drivers. Here we go again. How many customers are going to acquire? How long are they going to stay? What are they going to do over that horizon? Those questions aren't immediately obvious from these disclosures. Let's just talk about them. This thing on the left is what we call the C3, the customer cohort chart. Um, this is kind of an ugly version of it. I'll show you a, a more sensible one on the very next slide, but this is exactly the way Farfetch put it out there. That big, whatever color that is, that kind of maroon, just shows you the amount of purchases by new customers. So it's not a particular cohort over time, it's the new customers over time. I'll, I'll show it to you the right way on the next slide. Um, on, on the bottom right over there, you see the number of active customers and total orders in each year. And on the top right, it's kind of interesting. Here's their LTV to CAC chart. But what's interesting about it is that they are grossly understating the value of their customers because they're just looking at historical profitability and calling that LTV wrong, as you all know now. Um, so when they're, they're quoting these kinds of ratios, they're way, way, way too low. What company wants to undervalue itself when they're about to do an IPO? I'll show you the right numbers in just a little bit. So we're going to fit models to this. Again, it's not curve fitting. And if you've been reading, if you, the, the little books floating around on the tables about lifetime value, read that. That's good stuff. The Castora team has done a really great job of taking all these nerdy analytical models that have been developing over the years and putting it out there in plain English and making it not only understandable, but huh, we ought to do this stuff. And if you look at some of those models, you kind of skip past the semi-technical parts. That's what I do for a living. It's taking those very same models, which are some slight tweaks to them. They're not even that interesting. And fitting them to this crazy limited data set. All right, so again, I'm not curve fitting. I'm telling a story about the underlying customer behavior, but it just happens to fit the curves beautifully well. So the top line is the actual data. So we reframe that C3 chart in a more sensible way. So here's the value of each cohort, each, each uh, yearly cohort you can see going across from left to right. Um, on, on the bottom is how well the model fits that data. And again, our goal isn't to fit that data as accurately as possible. It's to tell the right behavioral story. The fact that it fits so well, it's nice. And you can see the, the, the total active customers and the total orders, blue bars being actual, the red bars being what the model uh, basically fits. It gives you that good feeling in the belly that we're capturing everything worth capturing, and it gives us the license to say, why stop at 2017? Let's project this stuff out for the next, oh, I don't know, two, three, 10, 20 forever years, lifetime value. As one more validation, we scrape these, these, uh, these things real carefully. Uh, Farfetch put out three other numbers, just kind of buried in the text of their various reports, where they're talking about the, the size of the customer base as of certain times. We did not use this data in fitting the model. We fit the model only to the disclosures that I showed you. Truly, that was it. But you look how well our customer acquisition model picks up each of those three data points once again, it gives you that idea that we're capturing everything worth capturing. Next three slides, what I want to show you will be the inferences from the model before we get to the forecasts. So in other words, now that we've told our story about, here we go, people, how many customers are going to acquire, how long they're going to stay, what are they going to do over that horizon, let's just show those numbers that are not revealed by Farfetch, but we can infer them given our, our comfort, our, our, our willingness to do so. They don't say anything about what the retention curve is. We infer it. And that's a very interesting retention curve. When you see it drop and then level off like that, that suggests there's massive heterogeneity. You got a bunch of customers who try it once and say, eh, but you then got a bunch of customers who stay with it forever. Again, there's nothing in the disclosures that reveals anything like that, but by telling the right behavioral story, we can piece together pretty much anything as if we had the raw transaction logs. 
So there you see the retention curves. There you see some indication of the basket size moving in the right direction. Uh, here you'll see some, some uh, uh, aspects of the unit economics. So if you saw on those LTV to CAC charts that I showed earlier, again, their data. When you look at it for real, instead of just stopping and looking at historical profitability, if we project ahead, how long are these customers going to stay with us? How many transactions are they going to make? What's the basket size going to look like? Add all that stuff up. We're looking at an estimated post-acquisition value of $1,000 per customer on average. Massive heterogeneity there. But still, an average of $1,000. Uh, and the CAC, customer acquisition cost, being not only quite modest relative to that, but also moving in the right direction. So we're actually talking about an LTV to CAC ratio that's more like 10 instead of the two or three that they were talking about in their own disclosures. This, my friends, is the truth. <laughs> this is what you should be making these investment decisions on, on the basis of. And it tells a very bright story about a company, albeit one where there's some noise around it and not necessarily a happy ending over here. So stay with me here. Uh, so now we forecast. So on the left, you see those four components of behavior. How many customers are you going to acquire? How long are they going to stay? How many orders are they going to place? Uh, and, and what's the GMB per order? You see the dashed line, that's basically the end of the observation period. That's the, basically the time of the IPO filing. And then we comfortably project ahead each of those four metrics. And then finally, the picture on the right, that's revenue. So again, we're not modeling revenue directly. Now, unlike that's what people on Wall Street would do or a lot of you would do. No, 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 no. Revenue is a meaningless thing by itself. Revenue is just this composition of how many customers, how long, how much. Those are the things we want to forecast. Those are the things we want to understand. Those are the things we want to make decisions on the basis of. Revenue is just the composite of all that. But given how well those four things work, it gives us some confidence that that's the kind of thing that the revenue is going to look like over there on the right. Now, admittedly, in this case, given the limited disclosures, and given you see that whooshy hockey stick nature of that curve, there's going to be a lot of uncertainty around it. We've got more to say about that. Okay, more uncertainty than I would usually have in a situation like this. So let's uh, kind of tell the far-fetched story. They put their F1 filing out there on August 20th. Uh, at that time, uh, they were talking about, uh, they were targeting $15 to $17 a share. We did this, this bottom-up analysis and said, wait a minute, this company is much better than that. So long before they went public, about a month in advance, we said they're worth $20 a share. Uh, and it was interesting, so there's a, a piece that we put out there on it, uh, and it was interesting getting some, some nice press coverage on it. And what happened is it actually went too high. And as some of you might possibly remember, um, they opened up around 30, and, and, and so it was like, we spent a month saying, this company is awesome, it's really good, it's really great, look into it, and then it goes too high. I'm saying, whoa, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. It's, too, it's not that good. Uh, <laughs> uh, and so uh, this is what's happened with Farfetch since then. So for most of the time, until just a few weeks ago, we were saying, you know, pretty good. You know, we were targeting $20 a share. It seems to be the appropriate baseline for it, but if anything, a little bit too high. So we're saying, good company, maybe they're not, not that good. And then, well, again, I hate to get technical with you, but the shit hit the fan in their, their latest <laughs> quarterly report over here. Uh, all kinds of things going on. As you might know, they, they had a, a couple of acquisitions. Uh, so there's all, all sorts of stuff going on. Uh, and the stock, you know, I don't want to say tanked, but took a, a mighty big hit, which kind of begs the question, why? So let's go back to our framework. Is it because they weren't acquiring enough customers? Is it because the customers weren't staying around long enough? Is it because they're making fewer transactions? Or is it because they're making less money when those transactions occur? This is the right way to ask the question, and we have the answers sitting right here. So we basically redid the analysis just a few weeks ago. Uh, and, and by the way, th th these, I don't want you to think that these are just going to cover your ass weasel words. I'm not that kind of guy. I like going out on, on a limb. But it is the case that for the reasons that I mentioned before, there was much more uncertainty around these error forecasts or around these revenue forecasts for Farfetch than most of the companies we've looked at. So as we were putting the original piece together, 
back in August of 2018, um, we, we had an unusual amount of, of caution that, that any one of these drivers that we've mentioned, not to mention the other kind of accounting assumptions, it's very, very sensitive to that. So we're kind of glad we did in light of, of what we saw. Anyway, so we redid the analysis and we found that for most of the metrics that I've been talking about, things are right on target. It's amazing how well the customer acquisition trajectory has been following what we projected, the, the number of active orders. You can see the, the bars in the middle. Now, they've gone higher since then because of some of this uh, merger and acquisition activity. And that by itself is kind of interesting. If we want to know what's the incremental value in terms of customer activity that they got through these acquisitions, you can see those deltas over there and say that's the value, at least as of now, uh, of those newly acquired customers. Uh, but the, the real culprit, the reason why they tanked, sitting right over here. That the margins, which looked so rosy before, the basket sizes were going up, the margins seemed healthy. Well, for whatever reason, and I have no insight into it, I've had no communications with the folks at Farfetch. This is all outside looking in stuff. They've been cutting the heck out of the margins. Uh, you know, so maybe it's competition, maybe it's saturation. I, I don't know. We could have that conversation. But the important point over here is that just from a pure customer count standpoint, how many coming in, how many sticking around, what they're doing when they do stuff, it's actually great. It's healthy. But the what are we getting out of them when they do this stuff, not so hot. A couple of other reasons as well. I won't even talk about this. It's, it's all covered in, in our blog post on it. Uh, and, and which is which is right there, uh, but basically we're saying it's a it's still a pretty good company. Now they they got to figure out how to discipline themselves on on the margin issue. And again, that's a that's easier said than done, right? But but at least we know that that's where the focus should be. And even then, if we're willing to trust these models and make an appropriate set of assumptions, we're saying that the company is now undervalued. But the stock, I don't even know what it's trading at today, but it went down to around 10 or so. Our best guess is around 14. Now, again, don't take stock tips from a marketing professor, okay? <laughs> That's not the point over here. But the point is to look at companies the right way and then bring it all together into the language, into the metrics that all those folks downtown want to talk about. But having a good marketing understanding of why things look that way. Uh, you know, because of all these sensitivities over here, instead of just talking about it, instead of putting out words of caution and all that, last thing I want to show you over here, uh, we put out a, a CBCV simulator. So if you want to understand, at least in the case of Farfetch, if we were to change some of these assumptions, and these include not only the accounting assumptions, like you know what discount rate should we use, but even some of the marketing assumptions. Like in there, there's a slider that talks about, you can see a couple of them over here, repeat purchasing and spend. There's even a slider on customer heterogeneity. Like suppose the mix of customers is becoming more diverse or less. What does that by itself do to the estimated valuation? Now, ordinarily, you think, what's the difference? Who cares? Well, it matters a great deal. And the more that you have kind of that long right tail of delicious customers who are buying a lot of stuff, you're going to have greater valuation. So to really understand that direct interplay between things like segmentation, heterogeneity, and overall stock price, I think it really helps build the bridge between all of us and those folks in finance that we keep kind of talking about with fear and suspicion, but I think we can now talk about and have them talk to us about the kinds of models and metrics and so on that, that we like to use and that we can educate them about. So that is my whole story over there. Um, obviously, I, I'm delighted to keep the conversation going, you know, whether it's with the Wharton hat on or, or, or Theta Equity Partners, just trying to, you know, bring some uh, some, some conversation uh, and, and bridge building across these different species. So I am going to leave it at that. Okay, let me hand things back to Corey Thurston over here. Thank you very much.